Hello, this is Dr. Brian McDonough, and welcome to the Dr. Brian McDonough Show. My special guest is Ray Hennessy. He is a former journalist. He is an independent marketing consultant. But of all things, we're going to talk about whiskey today, Irish whiskey. The Dr. Brian McDonough Show. Welcome to the show. Thank you. Brian. It's, a, it's a pleasure. So tell me, first of all, how did you learn about Irish whiskey? Is it something do you enjoy whiskey or was it in your work in marketing? How did you come across? I, I, in, I, I growing up in an Irish Catholic family, um, it, it was interesting. Whiskey and beer were very prevalent. You know, I grew up in Bayonne, New Jersey, very working class, very Irish. But whiskey was such a part of the culture. And you'll you'll blanch at this as a physician. But like when you were a little kid and you had a fever, they would give you a shot of whiskey. You know, the grandparents would to try to get you to sweat out the fever. Right. Um, and and so you you grow up with this all around, but it wasn't until I was, um, you know, I guess in my early twenties that I said to myself, I don't know enough about Irish whiskey for being somebody who went to Ireland all the time. My son now is in, goes to college in, in Ireland. Like it's been a part of our family. Um, and I, so I got, I wanted to know more about Irish whiskey and back then, and, you know, maybe the, um, you know, I guess the early 90s, you couldn't find good Irish whiskey anywhere. You had very few choices, but I liked it. You know, I was partial to Jameson. We were a Catholic family, so you couldn't drink Bush Mills because that was considered a Protestant whiskey. Like there were all these, these um, you know, different rules. And then um, I uh, found a whiskey called Redbreast. Um, that was very difficult to get here in the U.S. at the time, and I used to I used to have it shipped to my offices when I was a reporter at Dow Jones, and I'd have like a case ship it shipped, and we'd all like drink it in the newsroom, which I think is probably not not allowed now. But um, I, as as a result of that, I just became fascinated by the different tastes, the different flavors, because you know you hear about Irish whiskey and you hear about its heritage so much, but I, I don't think it's, you know, it was so overshadowed and by things like bourbon here in the U S or single malt scotch in, in, um, you know, in, in, from Scotland. And so I just became a proponent of, which means drinker of uh, like as many of the Irish whiskeys as I could get my hands on. And, and it's honestly, it's only been interesting. It's only been, um, recently that it's gotten interesting in that that business you know i i became fascinated with the history you know the irish will claim that they invented whiskey right and the word whiskey comes from a, a gaelic um phrase for water of life um and the first uh uh the, the first mention of whiskey is from the 1400s like the annals of clan mcnoise yeah. um, they mention how a clan chief drank water of life, but it, you know, uh, aqua vitae, but it turned out to be um, aqua mortis because he drank it and died. Um, and that's the first known mention of whiskey anywhere, right? Um, but it was enough of a business in Ireland that by the 1500s, the British who, you know, occupied Ireland till the 20th century, they were actually like taxing it. And Irish whiskey, by the time that market developed, um, Irish whiskey, which had a distinctive process in distilling, was was something that was prized in the 19th century, really around the world. Um, and then suddenly in the 20th century, it was gone. And when I say gone, by the 1960s, there were three distillers and only one distilled three weeks in a year. The entire industry was completely wiped out in the first half of the 20th century for a number of different reasons. Yeah, what were some of the reasons? Well, I mean, first and foremost, you had the um, Irish uh, independence movement. So in 1916, um, the, um, you know, the Irish rose up against the British initially. Um, and as a result, the British created economic sanctions on Irish businesses exporting. And one of the things that they targeted was the, the whiskey market. So you had that. But right after that, you also had prohibition in the U.S. 
And, you know, the U.S. was a huge market for Irish whiskey. They, they loved the taste. What prohibition changed, and they, it was actually the Kennedys sort of, you know, screwed over the Irish, believe it or not, because um, they started importing and all those bootleggers started importing from Canada. So the Canadian blends became more popular than the traditional Irish whiskeys. Interestingly enough, some you would go to some speakeasies um, and they would tell you you were drinking Irish whiskey, but you were drinking like a Canadian blend. Um, and so like a lot of what we think about now is like, you know, Canadian Club and Seagram 7, that was being sold as Irish whiskey during, during Prohibition. So you had all that. By the time that's over, you had World War II. Um, and, you know, the whole focus of of the world and people were not buying whiskey in, in bulk at, at that point. And so bit by bit, the, the distilleries just all closed. You, you also had this, this change. There's a, uh, a, a process that the Irish whiskey use it. You'll see it now with a bottle like red breast where they call it a pot still, right? It's, it's what you think of a, like a thing of like a giant, like upside down tube or funnel. And that's like, the, they would make these batches of that. Well, you know, a, another Irishman, Aeneas Coffee in the 19th century created what are now the coffee stills, which made the blends easier than like the old, um, the, the old pot stills. So you suddenly had people everywhere making their own whiskey. Um, and, and it kind of diluted the Irish whiskey too, which was traditionally a pot still. And now you had more of these blends that, that were coming out. And so you ended up competing with and tasting like a lot of the other stuff that was, uh, that was, that was on the market. So it was in the 1960s that they were down to just three distilleries, uh, Jameson, John Power, and, um, uh, Middleton. And Middleton was the one that was only making for three weeks out of the year. Uh, and they, got together and they saved the whiskey business with something called Irish distillers. Um, and, and it's amazing that that meant that really into the 1970s, early 1980s, if you went into an Irish bar, you weren't really drinking Irish whiskey because it was really hard to come by. Wow. Um, and now this last year, and what really got me excited and, and the, the reason for the post that you saw was, you know, the Irish whiskey market crossed a billion euros in um, exports for the first time ever. And that's incredible for, you know, we're talking about 50, 60 years ago, a, a, a an industry that was dead, like dead. They invented whiskey. They invented the processes for refining it. They, they you know, the, the great Irish people were known for it. And the industry itself was, was almost, almost dead. And you know, as I thought about like that triumph, that's like hard work. And now there are so many wonderful whiskeys like that are that are on the the market now. And I, you know, I'm still very partial to Red Breast, which is the more traditional pot still. Um, but there's there's new. I just tried one. A friend of mine, I, I mentioned this in the post. A friend of mine gave it to me. It's called Proclamation. Um, and one of the great things about the new uh, whiskey, uh, it, you know, in the new distillers in Ireland is that they're they're um, embracing the heritage of whiskey again. So Proclamation's got a label that's got, you know, it's got the same font and label and it looks like the Irish Proclamation for Independence. They have the picture of the general post office on the back of the bottle, right? And and you see that. And as you go through like um, liquor stores and wine stores now, you're, you're looking and you're really seeing a nice range of different whiskeys for different, different tastes. What are the subtleties in whiskey? Yeah, I, I think it's what's what's interesting is that the the pot stills to me, and again, taste is all personal. With 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 whiskey, when you when you sip a pot still, for instance, you're going to find a a, a little hint of spiciness to it. So that's why I like red breast. Red breast is a very nice deep flavor to me. Um, I used to say it's like an angel crying on the tip of your tongue. Um, and, and you also going to get the hints of whatever kind of casks that it was uh, barreled in. So, you know, some of those are brandy casks. They, so they'll have um, a nice um, cask finish to it that you can, you can perceive when, when you drink it versus some of the, some of the blends, which sort of all taste the, the same. I, I think with, with me, whiskey has um, three sensations, right? There's the initial taste that to me, what I like is something that's very, um, very light coming in. 
then is finishing nicely and then is going down nicely. Because again, like sometimes the harsher ones, you'll immediately get that, you know, that feeling in your gut, like it's burning, right? And I never quite understood, you know, while, while I enjoy single malt scotches and things like that from time to time, some of them are so, so heavy um, that, you know, it's, it's almost like you're drinking medicine. But, you know, again, you grin and bear it and smile and, and, and do it. Um, uh, I, I, so, so that's what I think the Irish whiskey is, is different too than what a lot of people here in the U.S. will be bourbon aficionados and, and bourbon's nice. I think there's this race to, to sort of get, you know, deeper and more complex in the, in the taste. When, in fact, I think the best bourbons that have ever been made are very simple. Like they taste good, they finish well, um, and and people enjoy them. They have hints of different things. Um, so uh, you know the, the Irish Irish whiskey. If if um, if people wanted to just start, you start with the blends that you know. You start with like Tullamore Dew is a great um, you know a, a a great whiskey. It was one of the first blends um, that was that was made there in Ireland in in Tullamore. Um, and actually the dew in that is everyone thinks that that's like dew on the grass. It's actually, um, can't remember the guy's name, but it's his initials. D E W was the guy who, um, uh, founded the distillery in Tullamore. Um, and, uh, you know, it's, it's a wonderful flavor and wonderful taste for, a, for a blend. Um, and then, you know, Jameson is usually the go-to blend. That's a good introduction. If you want things that taste really good again red breast uh there's something called green spot and red spot they're 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 very good and then i mean the the top one is um called middleton middleton very rare which is a great whiskey again from one of the three um distilleries that that existed and that is such a pure um pure taste it's also very expensive you're 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 spending you know, upwards of two hundred, three hundred dollars for a bottle, depending on what you're getting. Getting, and they do the whole thing where it's in a, you know, wood box. You get an invitation to the distillery when you buy the box. Um, it, so it's really up to your price point. It's up to your taste, and it's up to experimentation. And as with all, um, as with all spirits, like you don't, you never want to overdo it. These are designed not to, not to drink, but to sip. Um, and I think. That when you sip and savor. So how is whiskey best consumed and how do you, how do you, for instance, drink it? What do you have, when you want to relax, is it a, a glass, a shot, or what do you do? Uh, I don't, I don't do shots. Um, I, I, um, I think it depends on the whiskey. So if I'm trying a whiskey for the first time, um, again, I mentioned that, um, that whiskey proclamation the other day, when I, when I was trying it the first time, I always have it neat. I pour a little in, in a glass, swirl around and sip it and then sip it again. And then if I decide that it needs some ice, um, you know, we'll put some ice in. Uh, certain whiskeys I will never put ice in. I'll just drink neat and I sip. Um, and I, I really will make, you know, a couple of fingers worth of whiskey last an evening. Um and, and it is nice. It is very warming, right? It is like a, um, you know, like a, a, a good Irish whiskey can be akin to a brandy or a cognac if you're sitting by the fire and you're, you know, just, just sipping the night away. Those are not things that you, you down. One of the renaissances of Irish whiskey in the 19th century was that there was a, um, there was disease in, in France among the, um, you know, among the distilleries. And it almost wiped out the cognac market. And the and despite my last name being Hennessy, I don't like cognac at all. I've I've never been a big fan of of cognac. Um, and everybody when they hear my last name, they're like, "Oh, I know Hennessy." Yeah, well, I don't. Um, but what that did is people replaced on the continent cognac with Irish whiskey because of the depth and 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 things like that. So that's the way I like to to drink it, and that's the way I like to to think about it. Like you know. It, it actually pains me to see people, you know, just, you know, doing shots and things like that at bars and stuff like that. It's, that's not the good for your body. And it's also not really honoring what it is that you're consuming. Um, 
so I think you need to be, uh, you know, a, a little more moderate in it. You can, you can enjoy it and get a wonderful, wonderful range of flavors. Well, you know, it's interesting you mentioned, you know, the whiskey and honoring the body. Because first of all, as a physician, I want to say that's important. So many of the writers, and so many of the people had short lives due to whiskey and due right. to excessive alcohol. So there must be a part of it that be, there are people who consume it in different ways. Yeah. And, and don't forget, like in, in Europe in particular, and I have to admit to not knowing how it is around the world, but, you know, through the, the history over the, you know, hundreds and hundreds of years has been that, you know, the water was so bad that you drank ale or watered wine or things like that. And so, you know, from the middle ages on up, um, even into the 20th century, you know, standards, water standards, things like that were not as high there. And it was deemed safer, you know, to drink things like beers and whiskeys. And I know in Ireland, like, you know, they're the, the famous sign, like Guinness is good for you. There are doctors who would, would tell people, you know, drink a pint of Guinness when you're pregnant, um, just to, you know, make sure that, you know, you're getting your vitamins and you're healthy. Um, and, and the pub in Ireland is the central part of most villages but not to the point where like, you know, I think people have a misconception that folks go there and they get drunk every night. They really don't. They'll sip a pint of, of, of beer. They'll, you know, sip a, a glass of whiskey. They won't go crazy with, with things. I think what, what's interesting is you, you look at a lot of the, um, the poets and artists and folks like that who, um, who are Irish, who ended up, you know, drinking themselves to death. A lot of them did that over here in the U.S. once they got here. Um, because it's a completely different environment. And as you started saying, like, I think the U.S. has a different approach to alcohol and spirits than um, than other countries do. It's almost like art in a sense. I'm, I get the sense you're saying it's in the eyes of the beholder, mm -hmm. um, just like with wine or whatever. You know, you, you sample a couple of whiskey, see what you like. It's not necessarily important uh, that you drink a specific type or whatever. That, that it's for anything, yeah, that you don't recommend or you think could be problematic. I mean, I would not go to the um, if if you're looking for whiskey in general, um, you have a range of of tastes. There's an American whiskey called uh, Misunderstood, believe that's got a ginger flavor to it that I just love. It's that now my favorite American whiskey, um, and but that has like again that ginger taste to it. So that's not for everybody. Um, if you're looking at like the uh, like Laphroaig, which is one of the the big single malt scotches, right? That's that's uh, has a peat they use like they burned peat to to as part of the distilling process, and so like it's got that peat flavor, and it's not for everybody, right? It has some sometimes a like an, uh, a very I I think it's a an awful taste at first. I I like sometimes how it finishes. I, I think that the trick is to, if if you're looking for something that is very clear, refined, with sort of the hints of different flavors, you're probably going to have to go up in a in a in a price point. You're probably going to look at you know something that's like an 18 year old or or you know something along those lines, um, and and it you'll find that it, you just have to mix and match. Everybody's taste is different. You know, it's funny that you say art. There's art that really speaks to me and there's art that I will never understand. And that I think is the way with, um, with whiskey and really with, with, um, with all spirits now, nowadays. So you just try it. Don't be afraid to try it. And, you know, again, like, you know, go out, see what's on the menu, try something, um, ask a bartender, like good, um, good bars with good cocktail programs generally have bartenders who know what what they're, um, you know, what they're doing. And just like a sommelier with wine, they can probably guide you to something that, that you, uh, you like. Um, and it, again, it's not, it's, it's not for everyone, but there's something for everyone. And when you go to Ireland, if you travel to Ireland and you get some whiskey, pretty much go to any pub and just sample what they, I'm sure you have the choices, right? That you'll, you'll have a, a wide range. What's really funny, Brian, is like, you would go to pubs in Ireland in the 70s and 80s and you couldn't get a lot of good whiskey. You got pretty much the same thing that, you know, over and over. It was not a very big seller, which was crazy. Um, 
I, I think if you ask the owner of a, of a pub what whiskey that you want, they'll, they'll do two things. They'll point you in the direction of something local, which is great. There are so many local distilleries now that are selling into, to pub. I know, you know, Galway, um, you know, there, there are a number that are all around in that County that sell into that town because of, of the college. Um, and you get things that you can only get in, you know, a handful of pubs in Galway there, try that right? Ask and, and try that because you're really getting kind of the local, the local flavors. And this is, to me, it's about heritage, right? It's about history. I, I, I love being able to, to sip that like a, a pot still and know that that was the way whiskey was originally made and was supposed to be made. Um, and it's something as a, you know, somebody with a strong Irish heritage and a strong love for, for Ireland, it, it it's, makes me happy. You know, it makes me happy to be uh, a part of that history and see it still alive again, given because it was almost put out of business not 50 years ago. Well, Ray Hennessy, I want to thank you for joining me. This was really enter entertaining, informative, and, you know, and I'm sure people, depending on who's watching, if they have a great knowledge of whiskey, they realize you do. And But but for uh, the, the general person like me, I, I always enjoyed asking questions when you don't know as much because you learn so much, too. And uh, I appreciate your taking the time and joining me. It's been it's been an honor. Thank you. Thank you so much. And uh, thanks, everybody, for watching. And as I'm learning to say, please subscribe, like this if it's good, get more people to follow the channel. And thanks again for taking the time. The Dr. Brian McDonough Show.